Hey everybody, welcome to week three. Uh, today we're going to take a look at Plato's Allegory of the Cave and begin our discussion on metaphysics and epistemology. We are leaving logic behind, however we will be using it. Uh, in fact, the discussion for this week is going to ask you to write an argument in, in standard form uh, based on something that you hold as a, a foundational belief, uh, something that you assume uh, is true about the world or about knowledge. Uh, you're going to be doing that for the discussion this week. <clears throat> and before we get going today, just a, a quick couple reminders. As usual, please make sure you are participating in the discussions. The discussions can be found in the discussions tab of Blackboard. And make sure that you are taking the assessments. The assessments are now up in the learning modules in the week that we're working on. So this week, week three, if you go into week three, you'll see the lecture slide without the audio. You'll see the lecture slide with the audio. And then you'll see the learning objectives, the video, and the assessment. So please make sure you are taking that. Uh, it is officially too late to do anything. Um, from week one. So I hope that your discussion one is in. I hope that you've done assessment one. And we are now in, if you haven't done week two's discussion or week two's assessment, this is the last week. Remember, you can only turn things in late up to a week late with that 20 point reduction or 20% reduction. And then I just won't be accepting it after that. So make sure that you're getting everything turned in. If you have any questions, as usual, reach me in the Q&A section of the discussion thread, or you can email me directly, and I will try to respond to you as, as soon as possible. So without further ado, let's begin our talk of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. So Plato's Allegory of the Cave is an important uh, piece of writing for philosophy, and it's really an introduction to what we're going to be doing this week. We're going to focus our attention in on metaphysics and the talk of what exists in the world, and we're also going to talk about epistemology. How do we know we know things? And this story kind of gives uh, us an understanding of the problems that, that arise we often hold certain beliefs as fundamental, as true. Uh, but after reading the story, hopefully it'll get you to start questioning those basic, foundational, fundamental beliefs that you hold and really kind of get you to think that it may or may not be true. I mean, when we're trying to really defend the truth of something, when we're really trying to know the right answer, uh, it's not as easy as we typically think it is by just looking to Wikipedia and finding a fact or looking to a statistic to find a fact. Uh, there are little aspects of everything that we do that have potential flaws, and looking at the allegory of the cave will really highlight where we go wrong uh, when we think things could be true or when we think things are true or how we know things. And so a couple of things, a couple questions actually to look out for when you're reading the allegory. Uh, take note to the setting and, and really be able to explain how the story goes. Also, what happens to the prisoner and his quest in not only discovering truth, but then being able to explain it uh, to his fellow prisoners. So uh, we'll begin by, uh, I'll explain the story a little bit, and then you can also watch some videos. The, the crash course video that I've posted for this week also gives an explanation of uh, the story, and then your reading uh, is the story as well. If you have any questions about the story or the impact, please let me know in the discussion threads. Or, as usual, you can email me and we can discuss it there. And so, 
what this myth is really describing is, is the philosopher's journey, the climb from the dark cave of philosophical ignorance, right? How we really gain an understanding of the world and how we begin to know things about the world. And you'll see that in this myth, uh, the protagonist often makes uh, mistakes and doesn't really understand certain aspects and finds it difficult to go about this journey. And so it'll be an important undertaking, not just for purposes of understanding the story, but really to do philosophy, right? We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the character and be there for this entire course. And I hope beyond this course, if you really begin to philosophically look at the world and arguments and facts the same way. The picture depicted is basically the backdrop and story of Plato's allegory of the cave. So while you look at this picture, I'll explain how the allegory goes. And you'll notice, uh, <clears throat> essentially, there is a, a hole in the ground, a cave in which there is a fire on top of a ledge with a, with a path, a walkway. You see the gentleman <clears throat> in robes walking, holding uh, <clears throat> spears of uh, vases or artifacts, shapes, and they're walking behind this wall. Now, picture on the other side of the wall, you see the prisoners chained on the ground and forced to look at this wall with the shadows that are being reflected on the wall by the fire. And so this is going to be the setting for Plato's allegory of the cave. And again, it's going to express the process of doing philosophy and the journey that we're going to be taking in this class as well as in your life. And so when we think of the prisoners sitting looking at this cave, imagine they're forced to look at the cave. They're forced to look at these shadows. Imagine them being chained up they can't turn or swivel their heads to see one another. They're basically born into this position. So the only world that they know is the world of these shadows. They can speak to one another, but even their speech is just echoes reflecting off of these cave walls. And so everything seems a bit muffled or echoey or just not sounding completely right. And so growing up and looking at these shadows, as unrealistic as it is, and I hope right, we're not latching on too much to the uh, notion that this is unrealistic and could never happen. Of course it can't, which is why it's a, a myth explaining the process. But imagine looking at these cave shadows. <clears throat> and as the men in robes walk by, you see the shadows moving by. You see the noises, or you hear the noises from the people in uh, robes, and you hear the echoes of your fellow prisoners speaking to one another. So you know that everybody's there, but again, it's, it's a world of shadows. That is what is real. That is what we see. You yourself can't really make out your own body, your own reflection, or anything like that. You were completely in the dark as it was, uh, pun not intended, that this idea of the world existing around you is completely made up of these fake imagery, this <clears throat> idea that the world is shadows, the world is faint and echoey, and maybe... <clears throat> Uh, static in a way where the, the images moving by don't have the type of movement that you might see if you saw, let's say, a horse gallop by or something like that. And now let's say one day 
you were able to break free of your chains. So picture one of the prisoners on the left side of the wall breaking free of his chains and is able to look at his hands for the first time, to look at his body, to turn his head and see his fellow prisoners. Now, in this instance, even when you turn your head to see your fellow prisoners, it would still be very shadowy. Everything's dark. Remember, because you're behind this wall, the fire really isn't casting your shadow. And so everything seems a bit faint and odd. But you can see that there's other people there. And like you, they're looking at these shadows. Now picture once being free, you're able to climb over the wall and you see this giant fire casting a shadow of these artifacts that people are holding as they walk through this tunnel. Now, in a world of darkness, this fire will be incredibly bright. And so it'll be difficult to really look straight at the fire. But once your eyes start to adjust, you'd be able to notice the shadows. And you see that all the shadows really are is the projection of these artifacts that the people in robes are holding cast up on the cave wall. So you start to notice that that world that you thought existed is no more than shadows on the wall. Now, this is going to come as a crazy realization for the prisoner. His whole reality is shadows. And what seems to be real is the fire, is himself, the gentleman with the robes. But even in the cave, you still have this dark dwelling. And so imagine a prisoner hopping over the wall, <clears throat> maybe hopping across the, the pathway, past the fire. And you can see in this image now, kind of coming up to the mouth of the cave. And as you leave the cave, right, you're greeted with sunlight. And this sunlight is absolutely blinding. Because your life has been spent in the cave, coming up into sunlight would take much time for you to adjust. Imagine uh, being in a dark room. Uh, we've all experienced this when someone has hit the lights and they come on and it's absolutely blinding. And that's only after maybe a couple hours or a brief time of being in a, a dark room. Imagine an entire life in this dark room. When you come outside, it will take a good deal of time to adjust. But when you begin to adjust, you start to see more and more clearly that what your reality was, was nothing but this elaborate scenario, this cave, these shadows, and what's real in the world is the outside world. The objects, the people holding the artifacts and the robes, yourself, as you move and speak, the, the being outside will allow you to speak clear without the echo of the walls and you'll be able to understand what's real. Because as your fellow prisoners still down in the cave will attest to, is that they believe that the shadows are the only real thing. But you, knowing better now that you've seen what the shadows are, how the shadows are made, you understand the facts, you understand the science, you're able to really grasp at what is real and true. <clears throat> Once this happens, our protagonist climbs back down and goes to tell 
his fellow prisoners what he's found. He goes down to break them free so they can experience the reality just like him. And so the prisoner climbs back down, skirts past the fire, hops over the wall, back down to where the prison are, prisoners are. <coughs> A quick glance at the cave wall to the shadows that you would once thought was real is now nothing but just dark and gloomy shadows again. And not only are they shadows, but they're even more faint than they were before, because now with your eyes being adjusted to the sunlight, coming back down into the dark cave, you won't see as clearly as you did when you were down there uh, in the beginning of the story. And so even the pictures on the wall become faint. And those faint pictures are not the same as what they were. You know better now what they are, and going back to seeing them as the real creatures, the real objects of the world, uh, it's, it's impossible to do. We seem to understand now that those shadows are just shadows cast on the wall by the fire, and the artifacts being held up. And so it's difficult for the prisoner to really see the world that he had once seen before. In addition, when he goes to explain to his fellow prisoners what he's seen and where he's been, instead of them greeting him with excitement, instead of them thinking, how glorious you can break us free of this world that we live in, they dismiss him and actually think that he's crazy. Imagine for yourself having someone come up to you on the street, explaining of a world that you had never seen, that you had never heard of, that doesn't make any sense to you, you would think they're a crazy person because the world that you know and that you recognize is this world of shadows. So when someone comes up to you and starts saying, oh no, this world isn't real, what's real is this world outside, the fire that's casting the shadow on these cave walls, you would think similarly that a person's nuts. <clears throat> I know I've had my encounters with people who claim all kinds of crazy stuff, like they've uh, met higher powers, that they've seen the energy of the world, and it, it seems like absolute crazy talk. It seems unverifiable. Uh, it seems as though they're making stuff up. And this similarly will be the feeling of the prisoners down in the cave that have not gotten to go outside. They'll think the prisoner that made it outside will be crazy because he'll be making all of these claims that are unsubstantiated and basically something that aren't verifiable to them. This is the story of the allegory of the cave. And for the rest of the class, we're going to really be breaking this down and identifying aspects of the story that express this process of doing philosophy. For instance, when the character is able to hop over the wall and see the fire, see the artifacts as their shadows are cast up on the cave wall, he's realizing that the world he once knew wasn't in fact the actual world. The actual world is a world of tangible items, of three-dimensional shapes, instead of just the two-dimensioned uh, shadows being cast on the wall. This is the philosopher's climb to an understanding of what's real. As he breaks through the cave and sees the sunlight, the prisoner will be reluctant 
to really accept what's true, just like how his eyes take a while to adjust to the sunlight. When we are given new information, when we learn something new, it's not immediately that we accept it. We often have to fight to accept whatever it is that we're being taught or proven. It's why we often hold strong to our current beliefs. We're unwilling to change our beliefs. We're comfortable with what we believe. So to be told that the world is different is a bit unsettling and difficult to really learn. Most things that we end up learning take time, take a good amount of willpower and mental capacity to process all the information, just as the character from the story needs to get used to the light, understand and process the world of three dimensions uh, and the sunlight and, and, and everything outside of the cave. When the prisoner comes back down and explains things to his fellow prisoners that are still looking up at the wall of shadows, again, it really explains the process by which we are confronted with new information that goes against our current beliefs. Take, for instance, beliefs about religion or capital punishment, politics, economics. If we were told that the world were completely different from the world in which we experience, we would think the person's crazy because we haven't experienced these changes. We haven't experienced this different world. All we know is the stuff from our experiences, the stuff that we've been able to understand in writings and in stories, just like the prisoners, all they understand is the shadows coming back down and being told that what you believe is wrong, what you believe is not real, and there's another level of reality, it again is unsettling, which is why the prisoners aren't readily believe, believing of the prisoner that's escaped. And for the prisoner that's escaped, it's difficult for him to go back down and see the world of shadows again. Because once you get into a state of knowing, trying to then unknow something is almost impossible. I mean, imagine hearing bad news and thinking to yourself, oh, I wish I didn't know that. Or if someone says a, tells you a secret, and while it was exciting to learn of the secret, now that you know the secret, you can't really go back to not knowing the secret. The same is the case for the prisoner that escapes and comes back down. Once he understands that the shadows on the wall are just that, mere shadows cast by the fire, it's difficult to really appreciate the world of two dimensions as he once did and as the other prisoners did or do. Plato's allegory of the cave is an important aspect of doing philosophy and the questions that are going to be raised in this philosophical course. So throughout this journey, the prisoner is uh, forced to see objects in a different way, forced to see the fire, not ever experiencing fire. And it will be difficult to process all of this information because it's so new. The prisoner would be blinded when, left, uh, when he left the cave. And again, it would take a while to adjust to the new reality. This is a very similar story to that of the Matrix, which is something that's going to be referenced a lot today, as well as in the future of this class. In fact, for those of you that didn't get it in the discussion, the blue, the red pill is an aspect of the Matrix, where the lead character, Neo, is forced to either leave the cave and take the red pill, or take the blue pill, and remain seeing the two-dimensional shadow world. And there are a couple aspects of this allegory that really 
focuses on the doing of philosophy. And when we think of philosophy, we're not thinking of the truth of things. We're not thinking of answers necessarily. It's not an outcome, but the activity. We've all heard the old adage that it's uh, all about the journey and not about the destination. Same thing goes for philosophy. It's a journey to the understanding. It's a journey to getting to that truth and knowledge. In fact, some philosophers even believe that there is no obtaining the ultimate truth. And in fact, all we can do is go through the process and kind of move up the ladder, but never reach the top. Just like in the allegory, philosophy is an expression of hard work and experience that requires a process of logic, a process of open-mindedness and rationale. It's an activity that really frees us from an understanding of <clears throat> being set in our ways. If you think back to Russell and the value of philosophy, Russell claimed that doing philosophy is freeing. Well, same goes with Plato's allegory of the cave. Right? When we realize that those fundamental beliefs that we once had are potentially false, we stop holding on to them so tightly and become more open-minded about what the world actually is and how we know about it. Philosophy examines our most basic assumptions, and you will be examining your most basic assumptions in this discussion and in this class. For the prisoner, his journey was an examination about what is real and really how he knew what was real. Looking at the first question of what is real, you notice that the prisoner is learning throughout this process that that basic assumption of the two-dimensional shadow world was actually false and his world turned upside down with, the, uh, with identifying three-dimensional shapes, the fire himself, the sun, and the outside world. And so these basic assumptions are going to be questioned. And in fact, when the prisoner comes back down to the cave, the other prisoners that are still forced to look at the cave wall are refusing to relinquish that basic understanding of their reality and of their world, even though the prisoner that's escaped knows um, more about what is real and what's happening in the cave. So philosophy is going to test these uh, for you in this course, and again, hopefully beyond that. When we think about our basic assumptions, what are a couple that you find to be the basic assumptions of your life? Is it the belief in God? Is it the belief in morality and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you? What about the belief that family is all that matters or friends are forever? What basic assumptions do you have of the world that could be false? Looking at the matrix, the movie The Matrix. The character, the lead character in The Matrix, realized that the entire world in which he lived was false. The Matrix was essentially a computer program that he lived in, that he experienced. But what was real was what was outside of The Matrix, was the war against the robots, was being plugged into machines, this was the real world. And so any basic assumptions like the table in front of you or the steak that's being eaten, the reality of that in the matrix, for instance, is, is not real. And so we will be questioning today and in this course, what is it that's actually true? What is it that's real? 
I can look at my computer and my desk and think these things are real. And I'm 99.9% .9 sure that they are. I certainly can touch them and I experience them. I can set my computer down on the desk. But what happens if I'm living in the Matrix world? I know it sounds ridiculous and sci-fi far-fetched, but this is what happens when we get into philosophical argumentation. When I try to argue for the certainty of this desk in front of me, it seems as though I'm going to come up short. There's something in the way of a premise that is an assumption of mine that physical objects in the world are real. Now, what happens if they're not? And can I prove that they are definitely real? In fact, what does it mean to be real? Does it mean that I have to be able to touch them? Clearly not. There are plenty of real things in the world that I can't touch, such as atoms uh, and types of gases. So then what makes it real? My ability to see them, my ability to detect them with technology? What if I see something that's not there? What if I'm hallucinating? If I put a stick in water, it looks like the stick is bent by the reflection of looking down into the water. Does that mean that the stick is actually bent? Of course not. And so it would seem as though the actual world can be very misleading and my proof that the world around me is, is here and factual is slightly flawed. And so in this course, we're going to examine this type of stuff and determine what makes something real. How do we know that something exists? And if it does exist, what is it exactly? How do we know that we know something exists? While these questions seem overtly philosophical and it kind of gets your head spinning, it's something that will play a large role in the rest of our lives. The reason so is because when it comes to determining what exists and what's real, we're often going to need to make legislation and laws we're going to have to act morally or act in a certain way towards people because of what we determine exists. For instance, later in the class, we're going to be deba debating what it means to be a person. What is a person? And how do we know if a person exists? Is a person just merely a human? Is it the potential to be a human? Could a fetus be a human? Or could, it, could a fetus be a person? If we don't understand what it means for a person to be a person, then talk of capital punishment or abortion or rights kind of go out the window. We need to be able to determine what it means to be a person so we can base our laws off of that information. What about how we know something is true? We often make the claim that the atom is the smallest piece of matter in the world, uh, but are often disproven by new facts about the world. We once thought that atoms were the smallest um, piece of matter, and then we were able to split the atom and see that there are protons and neutrons within an atom. We were then able to split protons um, with the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. We can shoot two proton molecules uh, together, and their uh, collision will explode in even smaller pieces of matter like quarks or the Higgs boson particle. And so what does it mean to know something? It once was the case that uh, milk was good for the body. Now, recent studies have shown that milk is not really a good substance to be drinking past the age of probably 13 months. It was one known. It was once. It was once known that cigarettes were good for you.
it's through Plato's allegory of the cave that he really reminds us that the pursuit of wisdom involves this examination of these foundational beliefs, those fundamental assumptions that we don't seem to challenge much. We feel are just assumed, but are they really? Are the things that you assume are true and basic the same true and basic facts of the world that people in other cultures and other times have believed? What are some assumptions that you make about human nature, about morality? For instance, do you believe that you should accept them after reflecting on them? Or perhaps reflecting on some of these basic assumptions will get you to start to, to question the legitimacy of these beliefs. And so we want to really focus our attention on the three questions that are going to be the focal point of this course. More so the first two than the last. The first being, how do we know that the world we are experiencing, experiencing now is not the world of shadows? What would be the difference of you discovering that this world is really part of the matrix versus one of the prisoners in the cave finding out that the real world was not that of the cave, but of the outside? Why are you so certain that you're not in the cave? Do you have reasons to doubt that you're in the cave? Do you have reasons to believe that you have the pinnacle of knowledge and facts about the world? And how would you know that our world is in fact the world we are experiencing? These questions go hand in hand, right? What is it that you actually know? <clears throat> or is it all just things that you think or things that are kind of corroborated by other information that we find in the world. Remember, there are plenty of uh, facts that we've determined that have then been refuted and disproven. There are plenty of information that we once thought was true that wasn't. How is that different from now? Are we at the peak of uh, technological advancement to where we can know everything about the world? How do you know the things a thousand years from now won't look completely different than how they do today? And that the generations a thousand years in the future will look at us like we're in the shadows. And then if we are in the real world, if we are experiencing facts and truth, how is it that we're able to communicate these things? When we express our ideas of beliefs about the world, we often do so to no avail, just like the prisoner when going back down into the cave. Imagine watching a news broadcast where two guests are yelling back and forth at each other because they both think they know the truth and the other one doesn't. They're screaming at each other, they're bickering, they're yelling, and their ability to argue one point over another does little if no good, because by the end of the conversation, you never see one of the pundits thinking to themselves or saying, oh yes, I was completely wrong, you were absolutely right. They usually just bicker so ferociously that the mediator has to mute both of their mics and or just take them down off of the screen, and then go back into some monologue wrapping up any loose ends. These questions are going to take our attention during this course and should be what you're thinking about as we go forward. And so going back to the aspects of this class that we're going to be focusing on, think about the metaphysics. Metaphysics is again the first principles of existing. We often 
deal with metaphysics when we try to determine what it means to be a person, whether we are free or are determined, what exists and doesn't exist. Are we in the matrix? Are we not in the matrix? Perhaps you're thinking of the first principles of something like love, for instance. When you express love to somebody, what are you saying? What do you mean? When you say I love you to your parents, does it mean the same as when you say I love you to your partner? Does it mean the same when you say I love you to my friends or my uh, children? Understanding what something is and the reality of certain terms and phenomena in the world is going to be that discipline of metaphysics within philosophy. <clears throat> On the next page, there's a video of one of Plato's earlier dialogues called Euthyphro. The Euthyphro dialogue is going to be a dialogue about the metaphysics of piety. And what piety is, is the type of uh, religious justice <clears throat> and doing what the gods want. That the character is going to be focusing on in the story. Now, the video is a, <clears throat> a rendition, a cartoon, uh, is more comedic than serious. However, it, it should be explaining pretty accurately the difficulty behind doing metaphysics. Make sure you're pausing the video now or you're just going back later and taking a look at this video. Again, one of Plato's earlier dialogues where uh, <clears throat> the main character, Socrates, is questioning Euthyphro about what is pious and, and trying to get out of Euthyphro the metaphysics of piety. You'll see in the video that it's not easy, and in fact, an understanding of trying to determine what piety is, just like we would do with justice or capital punishment or free will or personhood or personal identity, is something that is very difficult. Plato is going to continue to question Euthyphro, and as we start, we'll see that as Euthyphro starts to defend his basic assumptions, Plato's questions get Euthyphro to really go in circles and not really be able to explain or express the idea of piety. By the end of the video, you're left with understanding less about piety than when you started. And this is what we need to do with everything, right? How do we know what this stuff is? How do we know what free will is? How do we know what is love? Or what is personhood? Trying to define it is very difficult and you end up getting a situation where if you were to have a child that just asked why, 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 you would back yourself up so far that you would get down to a basic assumption that you make and then realize, well, I have no good reasons for believing this basic assumption. And if you have no good reasons for believing the basic assumption, the reasons that that basic assumption then supports is similarly problematic. We want to make sure that we're going through this process. We want to be the Socrates character from Euthyphro. We want to make sure that we're questioning our understanding about the world and how we know that we know things about the world. When we think of this knowing how we know about the world, we're really focusing on the study of the nature of knowledge. Again, what information does the prisoner who escapes the cave know? How does he know that he's not in the cave anymore? 
He sees it. He experiences it. But how do we know we're not in the cave anymore? For those of us who have maybe experienced something higher, something more to the world than just that of this reality that we exist in, are they crazy? Do they know something more? Again, we once thought that the earth was the center of the universe. We knew that the earth was the center of the universe. Now, of course, we wouldn't necessarily count that as knowledge today because it wasn't true that the earth is the center of the universe. But how can we be so certain the things that we know now aren't false? And then in a thousand years, what they think is true, looking back at us and saying, well, they thought they knew that it was acceptable to eat animals. They thought they knew that people couldn't time travel or that things couldn't be manipulated by people's minds. If all of a sudden in the future everybody has the telekinesis, looking back on the world of physics that we know now would seem a bit ridiculous. And so what counts as knowledge? How do we know that the things we know are in fact facts? What is our justification behind that? And then, just like Russell explains, doing this process gets us to examine the world a bit more critically. We're able to use things like logic to really determine true from false things. But even logic, like math, is something derived from our understanding of the nature of the world. If the world were different, perhaps our reasoning and logic falls apart. Our arguments are based on logic and critical thinking. And so it would seem as though that's the best method for analyzing what is true versus what is false. So perhaps a better understanding of arguments, a better understanding of logic and critical thinking will help us to acquire some bits of information. But even like last week, some of you may have guessed or experienced coming up with good logical arguments about the world is very difficult. It's why we still fight about controversial topics today, because we don't have good logical arguments about personhood, abortion, capital punishment, economics, religion. These arguments are all lacking, just like my argument about whether or not the table in front of me exists in the world. There is a basic assumption within that argument that really de depends on what it is that we know and if it turns out that certain facts are false, then our logic will be mistaken. I mean, to this point, logic is our best source of deducing information. But remember, logic is only as good as much as we know the truth. If we can't determine whether something is true or false, then we can't really design or produce good arguments. If one of my premises states that the desk in front of me is here, and then that premise turns out to be false, well then now my argument is going to be unsound. So while I may be able to create valid arguments using logic and critical thinking, my ability to determine what's true and what's false falls, without, falls outside of that scope. And really gets one to wonder what is true? How do we know the things around us exist? How do we know what love is? What freedom is? 
what justice is. So this week, I really want you to examine the things that you think are absolute truths. Think about the most precious facts that you hold dear. And really think to yourself, how is it that that fact was determined? What makes that fact true? And how can we know whether or not it is in fact true? Perhaps we can do a little bit of math or look at physics or chemistry to determine whether something is factual. But what happens if our chemistry or our physics is somehow flawed? It has been in the past. What's to say that we aren't living in the shadows? Keep these things in mind as you go through the reading and keep these things in mind as you continue on through the readings for this class. Again, we're going to be discussing this understanding of reality, this understanding of how we know things. Next week, we're going to jump into metaphysics and epistemology. Right? This is just the introduction. This is to loosen up your mind and get you open-minded for this journey that we're about to take into the world of philosophy, this world of doing, of going through this journey. And hopefully on the other side, you'll gain a better understanding and a better sense of empathy for different perspectives of the world. Please make sure this week that you are continuing on with the reading, continuing on doing the discussions. Remember, get your fo first discussion post in uh, by the middle of the week and then respond to two fellow classmates. Make sure you are getting your assessment done by Sunday. Um, make sure you are watching the videos. Right? The videos are going to be helpful guides, uh, a different way of explaining things. Uh, if you need extra information, if you need supplemental material, please don't be afraid to ask. Uh, there are many videos on YouTube about uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And if you want to actually read the dialogue of Euthyphro rather than watch that cartoon, uh, if you just type Euthyphro into Google, I imagine the first link will be the dialogue. It's not terribly long but it'll give you a sense of what we're trying to do here in terms of go through this Socratic method of question and answers to get at the truth. And really just start opening your mind to the possibility that you may not know something or that it may not be the case. That way, you'll be more open to others' perspectives. You'll be more open to other argumentation because we want to use logic, we want to use our ability to critically think to really get us as close as we can to understanding the world. If there are any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great week. Uh, enjoy the read, and I will be back at it uh, next week on Monday. Take care, everybody.